Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Mike Steckline, partner with the Institute for Enterprise Excellence. I've got an experiment that we're running today, and it's got two presenters. I'll say some introductory remarks, but then turn it over to our presenters, and then we'll get into it. Um, the usual housekeeping details. I do have phones muted. If there's some background noise that shows up for some reason, I'll locate that and unmute that as well. Uh, we're going to have some time for Q&A, and I will unmute the phones, but you can always type comments into the chat function and um, get your questions or your comments out there that way if you'd like to do it in that method. Uh, we're recording this webinar, so you and others that would like to uh, listen to it and, and, again, learn from our presenters uh, will have access to that that I'll be distributing after we do the webinar. So here's the experiment. Uh, Garrett Bean, who's one of the presenters today, um, posited a question and said, would it be uh, possible for us to dig a little bit deeper in what it really means to own principles, systems, and tools, and the, the corresponding behaviors? And um, so, it, and he also said, as you can see on the question, it'd be great to hear from some other presenters. And I thought that was a great idea. I sent the uh, idea out to several other people that I knew that perhaps would have something to offer uh, and uh, had a good response. And we've had a number of people that have agreed to step up and they're going to um, give some presentations in this regard to give their thoughts on these questions. And so this is the first of four uh, webinars, and there may be more in the future if you like this format and think it would be beneficial. And so uh, that's how we'll proceed. I'm going to do some introductory remarks and just talk about at a high level. A lot of this is about deployment. How, you know, if you understand different principles are needed, the value of understanding systems, the relationship between what systems do, how they drive behaviors, how they help us get results. And, and all of the components of the model that we talk about, um, people say, well, this is great, but what do you do with it? So we wrote a white paper it's available uh, through the bit.ly link at the top. Uh, it's one approach to deploying this idea. It's not the only approach, but it's one approach. And basically the format uh, that we recommend is, is to think about um, this idea. First of all, after you learn some of these concepts, uh, think about experimentation, think about um, as, as you've done some experiments, think about integrating those experiments with each other, and then think about expanding through the rest of the organization. And what this starts to look like is an initial focus with top management. Um, and and uh, what I mean by top management is uh, as high in the organization as, as we're talking to. It could be a division of an organization. We have several organizations where it's part of a larger system, but anyway, the leadership um, is the first group that we're really trying to work with to understand or help them understand. So what do you do with what you're learning? And we describe basically some three steps uh, from a personal standpoint as far as understanding those behaviors um, that come from understanding the guiding principles, some initial practice, modeling new behaviors, and then creating new kind of conversations. And then it turns into some simple experiments around what do you do with that any organization usually has some internal resources that um, are providing advice to leadership or helping the organization forward. We just gave it the name CI Team. It can come any, in any number of flavors. And we think it's also important to work with these folks because uh, this uh, ability to move forward with this is different than perhaps what other what people have done in the past. It's different than leading an event. It's different than facilitating a team. It's different than teaching and coaching um, on principles and concepts. And so uh, they come along uh, to really uh, try to help transfer the knowledge about, about how this works within the organization. And then a follow-up step is um, when you think uh, you'd like to really start experimenting, think about a few model areas for some initial experimentation and what that's going to look like. And how long that takes to go from those basic steps that I've outlined is different for every organization. And there is a zero phase that we um, usually talk with leaders about just to make sure that they know what they're getting into. Um, and the idea is, is just to know that this is different and what's it going to take to really um, 
do this, uh, the term, will you be a good student, that came actually from a sensei that was working with AutoLeave um, from Toyota and um, wanted to know if the people from AutoLeave, uh, the people that make airbags, were serious about this uh, because it is going to require learning some new things and also unlearning some things that people have been familiar with. So, uh, and, and again, in a general sense, what that looks like, um, studying the principles, the new roles, uh, those three steps, and then thinking about initial experiments, simple experiments, experiments that leadership is running on what they're doing, and then um, start with experimenting with simple systems that connect to model areas within the organization. Again, a general framework. Um, this is an example from one organization, and they're, they're going to be presenting with us um, next month. Um, so when we get into that, we'll be talking about that. But how did they translate this general framework into what they wanted to do? They um, put it into a roadmap like this, and the team um, developed a plan, uh, which then transitioned into something that shows up here, which is, uh, this was an example of what I would use as I would go on site and give advice and see what was going on. I would try to identify, so where are the areas of focus? You know, there's a lot of things you could work on. Where are the areas of focus? And so this is just an example about how you could use a roadmap like that to try to explain. So where do we, what do we do next? Uh, and I'm not going to duplicate everything that's covered in the white paper. I will say one more thing that it isn't uncommon for people that said, gee, you know, what can I do? My boss uh, isn't interested in this. And this, this format works as a fractal. It f works at any level of an organization. So put yourself here, regardless of your role, and think about what is it that you can do. And then think about where would you get advice, perhaps inside the organization, perhaps outside the organization knowledge to, to move this forward. Um, think about safe to fail experiments that you can try within your area of, of responsibilities. And then think about what does that mean as far as explaining this and then beginning to interact with the areas outside of the experiments. And then at the high level or the macro level, keeping your boss or your boss's boss or your peers informed about what your experiments are doing. So this approach doesn't need to, uh, you don't have to wait for someone else to get on board with this. You can, uh, within your area of control, be the leader uh, and run your experiment. So I just want to stop at that point. I'm going to, oh, I will say two things here. Um, there are some quick articles um, from two great resources. Peter Schultes, who worked closely with Dr. Deming, there's a great um, example of what this looks like. He calls it the onion patch strategy. And Matthew May, who's done work with Toyota and other companies, he calls it the clamshell strategy. So if you go to those bit.ly links, you can see what they offer. It has to do with, so what can you do if you're an individual that you want to try this and uh, without waiting necessarily for someone in the organization to say that you can do it? What can you do without asking for permission from someone else. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter, uh, who's Garrett Bean. He'll do his introduction of who he is and, and what he's going to offer. So um, Garrett, take it away. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk with you guys today and share some of the things that we've been working on. Um, I hope you know what we talk about is beneficial to you and your journey. I'm still not entirely sure how my idea to, to Mike ended up with, with me presenting. I suppose it's, uh, I'm still a little, not sure what happened, but as I was thinking about that, I appreciate Mike uh, modeling the right behaviors with this. I think I, like many of our, our, you know, the people we work with come up with an idea and we lob it over the wall, hoping somebody else will implement it. And Mike, I think uh, did the right thing and, and, involve the implementer, the, the idea generator into the implementation of the idea. So um, hopefully uh, hopefully we can do this well together. So a little bit about um, Presbyterian. Um, we as an organization, we're a $4.3 billion organization. We impact um, about one in three New Mexicans, um, have um, over a thousand um, physicians and advanced practice clinicians, nine hospitals. Um, we have a health plan that's uh, been around for quite a while and um, Fluent, which is a um, portion of our business where we go out and try to help other companies, other hospitals and organizations 
other insurance plans, um, uh, share some of our learnings with them. Um, so uh, very much diverse organization. Um, a few more statistics. We have um, about 12,000 employees, over 100 clinics. Um, we're involved in home health, uh, have some patient-centered medical homes, hospice. We, we um, run a number of urgent cares. And you can see we're right about 1,000 beds total. So not a, not a huge organization as far as beds, but um, definitely uh, an integrated health system. In terms of my personal journey and experience, um, I, I've been fortunate to be involved with a number of, of great organizations um, throughout my career. When I um, uh, started my career, I was new to healthcare and new to lean and, and process improvement. And, um, and so um, I've been able to learn from, from these organizations on, on both those fronts. I've been with Presbyterian now for about nine months, um, but in the past I've had roles both in process improvement, um, strategy and operations. Um, it, I think like many practitioners, lean practitioners, my, you know, my, the start of my career was really just learning from books, conferences, blogs, um, and then going out and trying those things. I was um, in an organization where lean was new and it was new to me. And, and um, so I had to just kind of pick things up on my own. And uh, so that was the first part of my career. The second phase of my career, I was able to work with a number of consultants and um, was in a couple of organizations that did um, a number of rapid improvement events. And, and so had that experience. Um, in about 2016, I was introduced to the IEX white papers, and um, and those really have have clicked with me in my personal journey, um, and was able to attend some of their training sessions with with Mike, um, and that led to some experimentation with um, behaviors and system design um, at a previous organization, and then now working with Presbyterian. Um, Presbyterian. Um, again, I've been here about nine months, and so th this is the the Presbyterian journey, or the you know the the situation that I, I have found myself in. So, the Presbyterian imp improvement history really started with um, a Six Sigma Origins um, back about 2007, and this has really been a constant through the through all the iterations and and um, different versions of. Of the, and approaches to process improvement. Um, a, a Six Sigma um, project focused approach has been that consistent um, element. So uh, in 2009, they did their first work with, with Lean and um, tested out some of these Lean concepts. Um, this sort of evolved into a very tool focused, outcome focused approach. And, um, you know, I think in many places in the organization became kind of a check the box. Um, you hear stories about um, people's memories of this phase are tape around staplers and coffee cups. And so we've got that um, legacy a little bit to work with as we, we try to move forward. Um, in 2000, about 2011, the organization started something called the Innovation Lab. And um, this was really to, to take a look at the healthcare delivery in Presbyterian and, and think about it in a different way. And, and a big piece of this was the opening of Rust Medical Center, where we're doing quite a bit of our, our work now. And, um, and so they tried to design the, the facility with a, um, a very innovative, focused uh, design, and then open the facility with many lean concepts. And um, it had some great success, but as sometimes happened, the team was pulled away um, from those that early work in, in the innovation lab group was eventually reabsorbed back into process improvement with without that focus um, at at Rust Medical Center. Um, late then uh, about that time they did some early work with um, some more work with a, a management system and some of that initial work. This was uh, somewhat of a limited scope looking at at really just at huddles and um, and metric boards and um, and some idea generation um, with, with some limited training and, and really variable results in the organization. Um, in 2015, I think as, as a, a, uh, an offshoot of this daily management work, the pharmacy got involved with 
with Lean, and they've evolved into our model cell for the organization. And what we learned from that was they, they really had the right senior leader to drive this, someone who had experience with process improvement in Lean um, in another organization. And, and um, I think we in the process improvement team were able to adapt our approach a little bit to, to what their needs were and really brought the, that right approach. Um, where we're at now is, is some focused effort in uh, an organizational management system. So this has been really a senior leader driven effort where we've got some key senior leaders who are, who are driving this. There's the realization that we can't get where we need to go with doing the same things we've always done. And so we've been challenged to, to help coach and work with the organization to develop that management system. Um, right now, this is focused at um, at one hospital as we work and develop that. Um, and so this is um, really where we're what we're working on as an organization. So I'm going to use the same framework that, that Mike showed earlier um, to kind of talk through some of our our testing and and uh, experiments that we're running. So on a macro level, um, the organization is um, working heavily on on just culture and I think this is going to be key for us where because of the focus on psychological safety and I think it will lay a nice foundation for the, the our management system as we move forward we see this really as a, a foundational element of that and so we're doing some some work now to make sure that we can integrate well with this this effort and um, and it doesn't become competing initiatives at uh, organizational level as I said we're we're working on developing and testing a management system for the organization. And so um, we're doing this really at one hospital right now. And with the goal of, of really being to learn um, through this, you know, can we test, um, learn and refine, and then before we expand um, going forward. And um, I think a key part of this has been the, the um, senior leader and system uh, executive engagement that we've experienced. Um, that leads into that leadership um, swim lane where um, I think also uh, fortunately for us and, and for the organization is the senior team has really been focused on defining and um, outlining the ideal behaviors for a, a leader in the organization. And so we've been able to um, have a, a voice and, and collaborate a little bit with the, the group that's developing that list. And many of the, uh, you know, the, the list aligns very well with the principles of operational excellence. And um, so we're, we're grateful for that. At, at a facility level with the, the hospital that we're working with, the senior team, we're gonna um, challenge them next week and do some, some training with them on principles. and and help them to, to get focused on those, those principles um, at a, a site level with the management system we're working on. Um, another uh, great thing I think is that they're, they've been very open to the, the thought of coaching and on behaviors from the, the process excellence group. And so um, they'll be working with a coach. Um, within the, the improvement team, we are growing right now. We're adding a few new people and we're looking in, at our at our skill set in a little different way, and um, really looking, I think, at some of those coaching elements that that may not have been a strength in the past, or or may not have been a focus for us in the past, and and developing those further. And then finally, some experiments within our model cell. Um, we've we've um, which is our pharmacy. We lost a little bit of intensity over the little, last little bit. Um, with that work, and so we're we're refocusing them a little bit by by focusing on behaviors, and um, we went through some training on how um, principles and systems and how they interact with behaviors, and then um, taught them how to do a, a behavioral assessment. Um, we then did a, a pretty in-depth behavioral assessment, um, Shingo behavioral assessment, with the department, and uh, I think. One thing that'll be interesting experiment for us is one of the senior leaders took that as one of her annual goals to um, improve that that leadership assessment score, um, which will be an interesting experiment to see how that that in, impacts the the department. And then finally, we've done some um, work with um, 
um, systems design and really being conscious about, about our systems. So now I'm gonna focus a little bit more on our management system work. Um, so this is a model that we've, um, you can see our, our um, purpose statement for the management system on the left and then um, a model that we've used that we call the quality process or quality cycle on the, on the right. And we've used this um, for a number of years through the organization and we developed it and, and um, it's really become part of our culture here. And so as we started developing our management system and looking at it, we, we realized that it was a system of systems. And um, as we started defining what those key systems needed to, subsystems needed to be in this management system, we realized that there was a, a great alignment to this quality process. And so we've taken each one of these steps in the quality process and um, de defined a subsystem around those. Um, each one of those, we've we've worked to develop a purpose statement and, and some of the ideal behaviors with those. So we are, um, and, and so you can see one of those diagrams here where we're trying to to be clear about some of those behaviors and, and what the purpose of those systems are. So now we're testing though this um, this management system with five departments. We're working with an inpatient nursing unit with um, radiology, the emergency department, patient access, and, and an orthopedic clinic. And um, we've assigned each one a coach and we're, we're helping uh, and asking for their help in testing and refining this system. Um, and so really the learning is the, the primary goal of this. So behind each one of these systems, um, these subsystems, we've, we've got a design document um, that, that we've tried to use to capture what we're learning and, and um, what we think we know about this subsystem. And so um, we've, we've used um, something similar to the, the model that um, Mike and his team have, have presented. And um, this has been a helpful process for us to really frame and think about our subsystems. We've, we've intentionally left these in a little bit of a draft state, knowing that we're going to learn quite a bit through this this test with this these initial departments that we're working with, um, and so and we'll obviously go back and, and revisit this with the experts who who are living the management system and, and help to refine those ideal behaviors and make sure we've got the right outcomes and so forth. So, what have we learned? Um, I think one of the big learnings is that. Tools are fun, but it's really behaviors that matter. It's easy for us as coaches to get focused on the tools. It's easy for the organization to get very focused on the tools, um, but that's not what's gonna last in the long run. So we have to, you know, I, I find that I have to consistently remind myself to focus on behaviors and, and that we have to, as a team, consistently remind each other to be behavioral focused. The next learning is that it's really difficult to uh, identify those ideal behaviors. Um, we've spent some time as an organization with the um, uh, influencer model um, from the, the Vital Smarts group, which um, spends a lot of time on behavior as well and found a, a nice connection between those, the, the what, um, Mike and his team have taught us on ideal behaviors and what that team, that group teaches. And, but we found this to be a very difficult process to really know what those ideal behaviors are and, and found that we need to have that practical knowledge. We can't just sit in a conference room and identify those. And we've got to test some things out and, and refine those. We found a lot of value in assessments. And, um, you know, really to paint the picture in our, within the organization of current versus target state. And, you know, really we feel like this is uh, helpful in getting us focused on, on the right kind of problem solving around our, our culture. Um, we've, we've learned, I think, and, but we're still struggling with um, what coaching support looks like. Um, our tendency, I think, and in, in past experiences that we, we um, are forced to or, or end up walking away from a, a test that's going on or a, a department that's trying to implement some of these concepts. And we've really learned that we need to have that ongoing support from a coaching standpoint 
We're still not sure what exactly that looks like, but we know it needs to happen. And then I think the last, which we're still learning quite a bit on is everybody's job needs to change, whether it's in process excellence within our team or um, the CEO on down to every staff member um, in the organization. Um, we still don't have a good picture of what that um, target state is, but we know it's it uh, needs to change and, and we need to be doing things differently. So what are we struggling with? Uh, the first is the question that kind of started all this. What does it really mean to own a system? Um, what are those ideal behaviors? Um, so we're doing some tests and some some experiments around this. To um, We're gonna start working with our model cell group a little bit more uh, um, intentionally around this in the next few months. Um, but, you know, how do we, we need to learn that before we can help teach that throughout the organization and share that. Um, you know, the, the next point is around resources and pace. Um, we, we know that um, we need to teach new behaviors and it takes time to learn new behaviors, but it's also easier to sustain a behavior when everybody else around you is understands that behavior too. So what's the right pace and and and, uh, and and spread plan for these new behaviors as we as we work on them. Um, and so we're we're learning and struggling with that. Um, learning to be a new kind of coach, I think is another key point where we are realizing that that um, that skill set and the need for within our management system work may be a little bit different than than what um, has worked in the past. And so we are, you know, trying to figure out what that ne that means for us. And then finally, um, you know, what, what do we need from an ongoing coaching commitment? We know we can't just walk away from these departments too early, um, but we also know that resources are limited. And so what's the, the right long-term coaching plan? So those are the, some of the things that we are struggling with and some of the things that we have learned. Um, so I'll uh, pause there if there's any quick questions. I think there's time at the end as well, but I'll pause just for, for a minute if there's any questions specifically for um, for me and some of the work that we've done. And thanks, uh, Garrett. If anyone would like to pose a question, if you could use the chat function, otherwise um, I can unmute the phones uh, and um, we can go that way. Just give it a few minutes to see what sort of things might come up here. I'll unmute the phones and be prepared to put them back on mute. Uh, that's what happens when I unmute the phones. It sounds like somebody's making coffee. Um, but um, I'm going to unmute Brian. Uh, oh, I see a question coming across here uh, for Garrett. I'm going to unmute Garrett. And it says, how did you decide what systems to pursue in your model? Within our, um, oh, within our management system. You know, we tried to boil it down to an essential few. We knew we couldn't, you know, there's a number, you know, there's, there's a much longer list than a full blown management system. We tried to get it down to the vital few mm -hmm. that would uh, work together and support each other. And, and as we've compared to other organizations, we feel like we've got it, uh, um, to a pretty good list and a pretty good point. Okay. Um, That's helpful. I think it's helpful. That was Dirk's question. Okay. Um, we'll have time for more questions later, so we'll turn it over to um, Brian um, and see. Uh, Brian, can you still forward the slides or do I need to give that to you again? Yeah, you'll need to give it to me, Mike. All right. Try it now. I hear, um, is there something I should ex be clicking on to accept the slides if I don't see it? Did something come forward for you? Otherwise, I'll be your, I'll be your forward. But. Yeah, why don't we do that for the sake of time? Okay. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, 
Welcome, everybody. I just want to thank Mike you know, for allowing me this opportunity to share some of the work that's been happening over the last uh, several years here at Wellspan York Hospital. Uh, my comments are going to be mainly around York Hospital. I've been here at the hospital uh, in various capacities for the last 10 years, so it's truly been a journey. And um, I hope I can give you as much good information as Garrett shared with us just a few minutes ago there. Uh, so I'm going to talk on a lot of similar topics that you shared. Uh, I'll also kind of focus on some reflections there at the end there and um, from my learnings personally as I went through this journey because I'm an old manufacturing person that came into healthcare 10 years ago. So there was some transition time. There. Uh, so when I first got here, it, it, it was very traditional. Um, really, everything I was involved in was small localized project work. And I've told many people I felt like a glorified closet cleaner, you know, with five S's and those level of activities. Um, there was very minimal lean training. Most of that, people either being sent off site. Uh, some went to Robert Woods for Lean Six Sigma. We had a little uh, visit by some folks down there at um, University of Tennessee to teach some ED applications. Uh, so it was very minimal. Uh, and it was a very, very strong tool environment. We were just doing five S's and just the simple basics. The thing that concerned me most, though, was that uh, there was no lean vision moving forward there. It was, it was like they were dabbling with it uh, in the organization and trying to figure out what should it look like next year or five years from now or 10 years from now. Okay, next slide, Mike. So milestones um, were lean here at York Hospital. Um, I would describe the uh, as unexpected opportunities. Now, things that I wasn't shooting for, but occurred and allowed a door to open in order to pursue a, the next level of uh, lean implementation. And one of those first things was the opportunity to be embedded in the surgical service line here at the hospital. And that initial engagement was around some value stream mapping projects here at both York Hospital other of the uh, hospitals within the surgical service line at that time. So that got me a little exposure. It really helped me create some uh, relationships with the leadership team and the vice president at that time. And, um, it really opened up some other doors down the road. One of those doors was the testing and practice of components of a lean daily management system. It, it's really strange how this opportunity came about. It was we hired a new clinical director for periop, and that person was student trained, but they wanted to learn more about it. So the first engagement I had with her was coaching her on a lean leader E3. And her topic was improving employee engagement in the OR. So through that process, I recommended the use of some of the LDMS tools like a performance huddle, leader standard work. Uh, scorecard, those type of things there. And that really opened up the door for LBMS here at York Hospital. And the biggest thing I learned at that part, at that point is if it weren't for the leadership support from the vice president and his operational team here at York Hospital, it would have never taken off. So that, that's key in anything we do. Next slide, Mike, please. So the next kind of set of milestones came when Wellspan Health hired a new COO. And as part of their commitment to implementing LDMS system wide, uh, they expanded the department and put dedicated resources in each one of the entity locations, including medical groups. So, as part of that process, they sent a core group up to Theta Care to get some training around their LDMS system. I don't know how many have read the book Beyond Heroes by Kim Barnes, but that was kind of our model for LDMS here at Wellspan and York Hospital there. So that really, that really changed things getting involved in that. And then as part of that, when we came back after the two days of training, we had five areas we were going to implement the tools in um, across the system. Two were here, one in the medical group and one or two in the ambulatory areas. So we 
we're coached by value capture in the first cohort. That's how we titled these. It was five areas in the first cohort and value capture coach the leaders, the managers, the directors, and the two ups. Then in cohort two, we had about 10 areas. The value capture turned the coaching focus on us. And that, that really helped us because it helped us identify a gap in our coaching. And that gap was that we were coaching on the mechanics. You know, this is how you use a statue exchange. This is how you do a huddle. And it was very tool-based, mechanic, mechanical based. And what we came to realize is that we need to spend more time coaching on the behaviors and not the mechanics of the tools. Anybody can see the tools, but to optimize the use of the tools, we have to have the ideal behaviors. So that was a big shift in our thinking, and we put a lot of time and effort and focus in preparing the Next slide, Mike. So at this point, it, it, it's some things I learned because I'll be honest with everybody. When I first got here, I thought I had a fair grasp on lean methodology and how to implement and you know, had enough understanding to be you know, really effective. But I learned and I didn't. And that was uh, when I was going through the SME silver certification we had to submit a portfolio of projects i get this email back your portfolio has been rejected that, to me it was really stung wasn't expecting that there it's a lot of time and effort in it and they come around and tell me oh not so good so the learning i got from that is is they were looking for how guiding principles shingo guiding principles got woven into the project work. And at that time, I had no clue what the Shingo principles were and how that might look in a portfolio. So really, that failure on my part really led to some good learning for me personally. So what's this mean and how can I apply it here? And um, the thing I'll never forget is the um, Shingo model training that I went through with uh, Jake Raymer and uh, Mike how that opened up my eyes between a tool-based architecture and a guiding principle based architecture. And I think that was a key step for me is I worked with teams here at York Hospital and the system uh, on how we were going to implement a new way of running things. And it really changed the way I thought communicated and work with people. Here. And it supported the behaviors because the guiding principles are the ideal behaviors of an organization. We can get them in place. We can use tools more effectively. Uh, so with that, let's go on to the next slide. Um, experiments over time. I, I think the first non-5S project was an experiment, but not from me. The key here in the hospital was more about let's see what these folks can do. And, um, that was our first kind of touch in the clinical world uh, as we watch patient flow and outpatient uh, lab collection centers. As we worked through that there, uh, we learned some things that were very valuable there. And as a result, we were able to help lab services uh, realize 80% reduction in wait time. Uh, we also had a 50% improvement in patient, patient satisfaction. 38% improvement from door to door time as part of the process there. So that was that was a big opportunity to open up many doors for us down the road. Um, it also allowed me to get engaged in renovation projects. Uh, the flood bank and the labs was going through a major renovation. So working with members of the flood bank team, we did two phases of renovation. One was, I would call, moving the furniture. And that was all designed and, and implemented by the, the lab techs. Um, <clears throat> they were having flow problems in there. And people were very, working in very tight spaces and almost literally cra crashing into each other in turn of babies. So we kind of segregated the processes in the, each corner of the room and just moved refrigerators and freezers and test equipment. Centrifuges and 
really help flow. But the big thing from that is that allowed that team to think about the big renovation when they were going to cut the place and really put in new benches, new equipment, open up spaces and all that. And they designed the new spaces based on that. And as a result, we were able to downsize the refrigerator freezer system. They were planning on putting in. We probably cut it almost in half. We freed up workspace to have extra benches and an extra curtain with the equipment. So that opens the door for other renovation type projects that I really enjoy personally from my experience in the past. Um, the work in the surgical service line, that was all in because I was sweating bullets wondering how that was going to turn out for the clinical director. It was to me like one of those make or break things. With that experience, it helped open up the door for LDMS and WellSpan Health as a system. People started seeing the value in what was happening there. It's a really tough area. We implemented whole boards in the OR. Um, <clears throat> people were very cynical. But within about the first three months, we had over 200 opportunities to improve or modify. So suggestions for you know, improving processes there. And some of them were fairly significant financial too, which was pretty neat to say. Um, and it also helped drive employee Other experiments, and these are still kind of like experiments in, in work, is scorecard here for the hospital. The current system is where we report up to the system quarterly. You batch all these results every quarter, and therefore you don't have time to act if there's a problem or something in the wrong direction. So we're testing that and seeing how we can use that to better align all the teams here at the hospital and to react to things before we can slow down. And the one that's really in the infancy stages is developing an operating model. Um, we did a lot of work a few months ago, and then it kind of came to a halt. Um, so we're looking to pick that up. And the operating model, would, the purpose of that would be the link to the organization from mission to vision to value to guiding principles, and then the team that we use to drive the goal. Uh, so that's very similar to the Shingo Tanking data. But right now, we don't have any either document or anything we can use to align people from that type of thinking there. So my thought is if that can get into place, then we can use that as a springboard for really putting a lot more emphasis on Shingo Tanking data. So with that, let's go to the next slide, Mike. What work? Um, more opportunities lead to big opportunities. Uh, when I first got involved in PI here at the hospital, there was no communications uh, saying what we were here for and what we were supposed to be doing. So a lot of people created perceptions. Some of those perceptions were based on things like we're here to eliminate jobs. I don't know if that's happened in the past with other initiatives. That was a big hurdle for us to overcome. But through the small opportunities, we gained the initiative. Hey, Brian, if you could get closer to your microphone, that'd be helpful. Okay, sorry about that, Mike. No worries. The other thing was being embedded in the surgical service line because it allowed the testing of some of these LDMS tools and just lean methodology in general. And um, if it was successful there, you know, it was felt it could be successful in other areas too of the organization. Um, the advertising from the surgical service line really helped to open us, open us up as a legit department at the system level there because people were skeptical. They just didn't know or understand or have that knowledge around the methodology. One of the other things that's really worked well here is as we got into owning LDMS implementation here at the local entity level, we redesigned our training here. And we put a lot more activities in the training versus PowerPoint slides. And that has really changed things a lot here. It's really helped explain people to people 
how to use the tool and also the behaviors and purpose of the tools there. So those are some of the things that worked well. And if we go to the next slide, um, here's the things that didn't work so well. One of them is trying to force outcomes. And my example for that was in central sterile processing, we were implementing a case card process down there for the OR. And uh, people were just dragging their feet. And um, I was trying to force an outcome. Uh, I didn't have the buy-in and I didn't realize that. And so it was counterproductive to the process there. And, and so that was a big learning for me personally. I did too much of the work. And like I said, the buy-in buy was not there. And so therefore it kind of changed direction in midstream. The other thing that was an opportunity we missed here was not engaging system leadership in the whys and hows of LDMS sooner. Um, it was a very grassroots from the front line up type of uh, implementation to begin with. And leadership came back and said, we don't know what you're trying to do here. And uh, we just missed that. It, it would have probably expedited the implementation if we had been more sensitive and attentive to that area. Um, the other thing we're struggling with currently is not engaging the physicians sooner in LVMS. We have some things that we're trying to start up with some of the physicians and the hospitals here at York Hospital. Uh, with LVMS, we're trying to get them started on a statute exchange with a medical director and the various hospitals. Our ideal hope is to uh, get them to the point where they're creating accountable care units, where there's that dyad relationship between physician and nursing managers, uh, using LDMS as the bridge between the two. Uh, but that's still very early work there. The other thing I learned is that being adaptive, and that's specifically with the ICUs because of the complex nature of work and uh, the nursing team is focused around the patient most every minute of the day. And it changed the way they used LVMS. They couldn't support the way we were rolling out and we weren't very adaptive to their needs at that point in time. But if I had to do it over again, I would, I would certainly change some of that and how we rolled out uh, that to the ICUs. Okay, next slide, reflection and advice. Uh, uh, I coach my team. Every person in every counter is an opportunity for change. And that's because of those unexpected opportunities. You don't know when that person is going to create the opportunity to further lean thinking within the organization. So you've got to treat everybody like they're going to be your best customer for life. Um, always look for the early adopters. If you can get success with them, and help advertise it and it helps promote lean thinking across the organization. Um, we recently had a LDMS overview class where we had a member of the organizational learning and department, or I'm sorry, organizational learning and development department in, and uh, they're going to help promote LDMS now through their encounters with teaching others. Uh, be patiently persistent and passionate. People know, need to know that you're passionate about this work. But not everything happens, and I'm a testimony to that. Not everything happens when you think it should happen. But I've seen things sit on the shelf for months. Mike, Mike and I have talked about some things here at the senior level where it just sat and sat and then finally took off, you know, unexpectedly. But you've got to be persistent with it and let them know you're engaged. Focus on behaviors and not humble inquiry or I'm sorry, focus on behaviors and the use of humble inquiry. Don't stay focused on the mechanics. That's anybody can do the mechanics and, and not be effective, okay? Be flexible with leadership because they want to experiment, but that's part of their learning process. You need the guiding principles as a check and balance to the things that they want to do. And then what's your vision as a PI leader or continuous improvement leader? Where do you see the next steps for the organization? You got to kind of have that plan so when those unexpected opportunities come, you know exactly where to take them if possible. So those are some of the things I've learned the hard way here. But, uh, I think they've uh, paid off in the long run. So on this page, I'm not going to read these off, but these are some of the questions I have for the group there. If we 
have time to talk a little bit there and, and share some thoughts and ideas. Thank you. Appreciate you listening to me, and thank you, Mike, for the opportunity. You bet, Brian. That was great. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll do the same routine uh, that we did with Garrett. There's um, some lingering questions that showed up on the chat question, and I'll go back to Garrett on that. Um, there was a question that uh, Vicki asked, did you start with um, the willing or those areas with greatest need? Uh, we started with um, the willing mainly. So we actually ended up selecting departments that were high performers because we knew that we wanted to um, understand what um, good management and, and uh, you know, an ideal management system would look like. So we chose high performers and those that were willing. Mm -hmm. um, Garrett had a question about um, how was this accepted by the model cell if it was not addressing a particular visible problem at the time? Um, hope I address not sure. So, uh, oh, Garrett asked a question, how did you decide what systems to pursue? You talked about that. And then he said, so um, you picked these systems. How is it accepted by the model cell if it was not addressing a particular visible problem at the time by the model cell? I think I get it. Oh, how have they accepted the management system? Uh, they've, you know, it's it's really refining, taking what they've learned and um, over the last little bit and um, taking the key components out to the rest of the organization. So mm -hmm. they've been very willing, um, you know, and, and collaborators in this. Okay, great. I'll pause again and see if any other questions show up on the chat function. Last time I... Uh, opened it up, we had some background noise, so I'll try to minimize that. One of the things I'm thinking as I as I distill the observations, oops, I got some background noise, I'm gonna mute that. When I, when I, as personally as the facilitator for, for doing these experiments, as I uh, notice things, rather than addressing them directly in this webinar, I'm gonna, ponder a little bit and then in a follow-up reflection say here's some things I notice and then open it up for some collaboration with um, the participants as far as um, some uh, call it themes or learnings going forward. Um, so Garrett had a or uh, Dirk has a comment here it says he's working hand in hand with nursing leadership team and magnet coordinator to standardize principle-based involvement improvement practices, coaching them, problem solving, project management, and A3 thinking seems to be working well so far. And we do have Dirk as one of the presenters up for one of our future webinars, so that'll be great. Um, so what I'm gonna do uh, is um, talk about next steps and what's gonna happen. The recording from this webinar, uh, if you go to our website and you go to webinars, you can see what's coming up next. Um, the recording for this is gonna be available um, and so you, that's one way to find it. I'll also distribute it through our methodology so people will have access to the recording. And you can always go back to our previous events and see the recordings that um, came previously to this. Um, there was a webinar to be scheduled in May with uh, Didier Rubino. Uh, he had a change in his schedule, couldn't do it. So we're gonna reschedule that for the future. If you're in the Twin Cities area next week, I'm doing a, a workshop on systems by design and I've introduced this to we've introduced this to many many organizations and written a white paper on it and and both um, um, Brian and Garrett have been exposed to so how do you think about designing better systems and so information for that can be found at that bit.ly link wouldn't expect you to travel across the country if you're not already in the area but you might find it of benefit um, one thing we're doing with that group, uh, 30 days after it, I'm going to host a webinar where we can do some Q&A so that people can um, talk about um, their experiments that follow up from that July webinar. And I'm going to open it up to the public so anybody, even if you weren't at the workshop that day, would benefit from thinking about Q&A on how do you uh, think about systems, designing systems, adjusting systems. So again, it's, uh, the link is there. Uh, you can go to that and it's gonna be on the, the link is on the webinar as well. 
So further experiments in August, uh, we've got uh, Jamie Silva Steele and Yvette Senna from Sandoval Regional Medical Center, and Lisa Radke and Sarah Grew from Winnesheek Medical Center. Again, two healthcare examples, and so they've um, ex uh, agreed to share their learning, similar to what Garrett and Brian did today. So that's going to be on um, August 30th, and the link to get the dial-up information is there on that Bitly link. Then in September, um, Fletch Corbet and uh, Caleb Foss from Munson Healthcare, and then I mentioned Dirk Van Rossum, who's had some good questions. Today's uh, webinar is going to do some presentations similar to what you saw today. That's experiment number four. And then uh, in October, um, we've got Holly Prest, who's with the Kimberly Area School District, so um, outside of healthcare, but also related to application of the principles. And then Sid Srinivasan from uh, the Mayo Clinic um, component uh, organization in La Crosse um, is going to share his uh, reflections and the work that uh, he and team have been doing um, as um, they've been moving, trying to move forward with the application of this approach. And so uh, there are some experiments in the work or some ideas in the work. Uh, and you see what happened when uh, Garrett put out something and said, what do you think uh, might this uh, be beneficial? And so we're experimenting with that idea. So we have a number of other things that are in the works. Uh, we'll be putting them out there as we get them organized. We continue to do the principle, principle of the month. So in 2019, starting in January, every week, there's a reflection on a guiding principle. Uh, per month, a different guiding principle. So in January, it was constancy of purpose and then switched over uh, in February to a different principle. But every month or every week, there's a new um, reflection that people are willing to uh, think about, participate in, provide feedback on. So it's another way for people to think about those guiding principles. Um, and it's also something you can get access to uh, readily if you go to LinkedIn. If we're connected on LinkedIn, you can find it that way. Um, here the, are the conversations that we've had thus far in January, constancy of purpose, five reflections in February, uh, respect, every uh, or, uh, yeah, respect every individual, four conversations in March, focus on process. In April, uh, these were the questions around create value for the customer. In May, um, the, the uh, reflections on lead with humility, quality at the source in June, uh, thinking systemically has um, been the topic in July, and you can see uh, those are the bit.ly links to the latest reflections. This latest blog that I did this past week really got a lot of, of conversation going, or at least some participation on, we call it, I call it connections and consequences, and thinking about unintended consequences and understanding systems thinking. So there was a lot of activity around that. So if you have any ideas of things you'd like to talk about, um, just as Garrett did, put something forward and said, um, here's something that might be of interest. That's how you can reach me, contact me for um, getting something started and everyone will learn from it. So I wanna thank our presenters, both Garrett and Brian today. To take, they took the time to do this and uh, really appreciate them doing that, taking the time, I appreciate Everyone who participated today that hopefully, hopefully you found this a benefit, uh, feel free to share the recording link with others that you think might benefit from this as well. So I hope everyone has a good day. Uh, weekend's coming up, so have a good weekend as well. And um, if you, uh, uh, I'll see you then, or maybe I'll see you next week in uh, Twin Cities. Otherwise, we'll connect um, next month with the next webinar. Thanks again.